Father, as we come before you, Lord, we realize we come to a God who's able, uh, Lord, to a God who can do uh, exceedingly abundantly more than we could ask, even imagine, Lord. And so we thank you, God, uh, that that's who you are. And uh, Lord, love that reminder that even when we don't see you, you're working, when we don't feel you, you're working. Uh, God, we thank you that you're in complete control no matter what we feel today. And so we just commit our time to you now. We pray that you would go before us as we study your word. Please, Lord, fill us with your spirit. Give us insight and understanding into your word. And Lord, just bless our time together, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Good morning. morning. Why don't you go ahead and have a seat? It's good to see everyone this morning. Pastor Zeke is out of town. And so because he's out of town, we do what we usually do is we just, uh, usually between Pastor Gary or myself, and sometimes Pastor Jacob, if we want to steal him away from the youth room, uh, we'll just continue on through a book of the Bible. So this all started like in, uh, I think, 2016, uh, we had started 1 Corinthians. So what is that, like almost eight years or seven years or whatever that it's taken us to get to now Ephesians. Uh, and so Pastor Gary last taught Ephesians uh, chapter one, uh, maybe like three or four or five months ago, something like that. So we'll just do a little bit of recap. But Pastor Zeke's up north. Um, and in case anyone's like kind of newer here or doesn't know, um, not that we like to tell anybody, but people figure it out after a while, um, that like we're related, Pastor Zeke and I. Um, he's, he's the father, I'm, I'm his son. Um, and so the really good news, he's up with the grandkids in Visalia right now. The great news is that he's got all the grandkids in Visalia. So even my kids are still up there. So man, I'm looking so forward to my after church nap, you know, not being uh, bothered by the kids. And uh, just a quick little thing, um, we were up there to watch my nephew, right, his grandson, play ball. And he's a little eight-year-old kid, a little all-star game yesterday. And, uh, and, and when, when they were trying to mount a comeback yesterday, they were down by like 10 runs. And they came back to being just down by two. And uh, little Avery, that's my nephew, uh, hit a grand slam yesterday. Yeah, they still lost the next inning, but uh, but that's okay. We're just so proud. It was it was definitely worth the drive and the turnaround trip and all that stuff. So uh, so we played rock paper scissors to see who's going to come back and teach on Sunday. And uh, just kidding, we had planned it beforehand. So uh, anyway, so that but but um, if you remember, even throughout the week, be praying for Pastor Zeke. You know, we we like him to get away and rest. We want him to. Um, to be, uh, you know, just recharged and kind of all the stuff that he needs to be. So uh, we'll be praying for him. Uh, So Ephesians chapter 2 comes after chapter 1, of course. So uh, chapter 1 talked about kind of just the great power of God. You you see a lot of things that go through in the book of Ephesians uh, that have to do with uh, God's power. One of the greatest uh, pictures of his power was his resurrection that it talked about uh, last week towards the end of that chapter. Um, But you do see a few things in chapter 1, this foundation that's being laid uh, that uh, we see in verse 4 that God the Father chose us before the foundation of the world. In verse 7, we see that through Jesus, the Son, we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins. And then we see in verse 13 uh, that we were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. So you see the whole Trinity right there at work uh, in chapter 1. Ephesians, written by Paul, is very similar to most of the books written by Paul, where there's the start of the book speaks to uh, doctrinal things, who Christ is, right? Who he is, what he's done, and then you get to the second part of what Paul usually writes is then our response to him. So in Romans, we see that. Chapter 1 through chapter 11, all doctrinal things, this is who God is, and then uh, in verse uh, 1 of chapter 12, he turns the page and says, so now this is how you walk in response to that, right? Ephesians is the same way. Chapters 1 through 3 are all our riches that we have in Christ, and if you want to go home for some homework tonight, you can, Um, and then the next time we study Ephesians, I don't know, it might be two, three months from now, Uh, but you can let me know how many times you see those phrases or that phrase, in Christ or in Him. We see all our spiritual blessings that were given in Christ Jesus in chapters one through three. Then in chapter four, 
What happens in chapter 4 is he says, so then I beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you're called. And then from chapter 4, 5, and 6, he talks about, now this is your duty as Christians to live this way because of who God is. And it can't be the other way around, right? We're not called to live a certain way and then God does something. It's because of what God has done, our response to him is a certain way. And so we're going to get to that uh, today. Today, uh, we're only going to look at 10 verses because it's a very rich text. There's a lot here. Um, I, you know, on Thursday nights, we try to cover a chapter at a time. It would be, be very difficult to cover a, a full chapter in this sitting. So let's read verses 1 through 10, and then we'll pray again, and we'll get into it. It says, And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. Verse 4, But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you've been saved. And raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. Verse 8, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Father, as we come uh, to your word, we would ask you to make this book live to us. Lord, that you would show us yourself here in your word, that you would show us ourselves and show us our Savior. And Lord, we ask that you would make this book live to us. For your sake, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay. So he starts out by saying, and you, he made alive. Just like last chapter, uh, the ultimate example uh, of God's uh, power is the resurrection of Jesus. Now Paul is going to consider uh, what implications that has, Jesus' resurrection power now in our lives. He starts out and he said, you, he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. And, sins. and so uh, a couple reasons we always want to remember where we've come from. Right? He says, hey, you, he made alive. Uh, we were, what? Dead in our trespasses and our sins. And it, it's good for a couple reasons to remember where we've come from. Number one, it causes us to be grateful to the Lord. Uh, that, that we could sometimes, as we've walked with the Lord for, uh, uh, you know, a number of years, we can kind of forget just how bad things were or just how bad we were right? Uh, just how lost we were. And sometimes we could start to think, oh, you know, I don't think I was ever really that bad. I don't think it was as bad as, as, as whatever, you know, and actually God should be pretty happy that I'm on his team now. You know, I'm one of those guys, he probably wants me on his team. Uh, and, and we don't want to uh, think that way. Uh, but also it's good to remember where we've come from in order to have patience with the world around us. Uh, I don't know about you, but sometimes I look at the world around me and I get pretty frustrated. Anybody else? right? You see the way that this world goes, the things this world does, and you could start to be a little frustrated. And I remember um, I was talking to a buddy one time, and I was getting so frustrated at the way something was, and he goes, how do you expect the world to behave? Do you expect them to behave any differently? They're blind. How would they know any different? I'm like, dang it, you're right. So I should be more patient. I should probably pray for these people, you know, instead. Uh, and so that was a good, uh, a good reminder. Now, when we get into being dead in our trespasses, we, we need to also remind ourselves of the work of Jesus and, and the purpose of Jesus' work, that Jesus didn't come to make bad men good. He didn't even come to make good men better. He came to take dead people and bring them to life, right? That's what Jesus came to do, was to revive us spiritually, because we were dead. And that's what he says, dead in our trespasses and sins. Now, uh, uh, it's a little early on, and Pastor Gary covered it, but some of you might not have been here, you know, those four months ago. So we're going to touch, just dip our toes in the water here on this uh, part of theology. This is one of the more controversial areas of theology, and uh, in, in, in it's to what, in what manner or to what extent is a person dead 
in their trespasses and sins before conversion. So, so does a person have to be converted before they can believe? Or is there a prior work of God to instill a certain faith that is still short of conversion? Uh, so those who argue um, that there must be a, a regen or that there must be a regeneration even before someone's belief um, because they like to say that, that a dead man cannot believe, so you must be regenerated before you can believe. Um, now, we don't ascribe to exactly that. Um, and so, uh, you know, we would believe that, that this takes that kind of thinking a little further than, in, than intended to say that unredeemed man is exactly like a dead man, um, because we also know that a dead man who's completely dead could not sin. And we still sin, right? I don't know about you. I know I do. Um, so, so we have to leave room in any time we're talking about salvation, like how much of it is God's part and how much of it is our part to respond to what God has given. Now, I will in no way go all the way to one side and say that we have all the choice in the matter. I couldn't say that because the Bible doesn't say that completely, right? But I can't go the other way and say we have no say in it, and it's all God. Now, who's stronger, me or God? Me to believe or God to save? Who's stronger? Well, obviously God is stronger, right? He, he's infinitely stronger than I am. And so um, whatever the amount, we have to leave some room uh, for man's free moral agency to choose. We have to leave a part. No, so I don't know. Is that like 99% and 1%? Is it 99.99999% and I get the 0.00001%? I know it's certainly not the other way around that God only gives 1% and I give 99. Certainly not, right? So we, but we have to leave place some place. Why? Because the scriptures leave place for that. Any place in the Bible that it speaks of election or predestination or anything like that, and I'm, I'm hard-pressed to find an example when it's not this way, is he's speaking to those who are already believers. It, it's somewhere written where someone is already a believer, and he says, you've been chosen from the foundations of the world. Here, even in Ephesians, that we see in chapter 1, verse 4, he says, and, uh, and just just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. He's writing to a group of Christians. The Ephesians isn't a book to non-believers. It's to the church that's there in Ephesus, isn't it? So he's writing to people who already believe. So he's saying, you've been predestined. You've been called from the foundations of the world. But, and, and I'm hard pressed to find an example the other way, that usually when we talk about preaching the gospel to the masses, we see in scripture that there's not usually this like, wait a second, have you been regenerated yet? I don't even want to give you the gospel if you can't even receive the gospel. We don't see an example of that anywhere in scripture. That, there, that in scripture, we see the call just goes out to people. That other part is the work of God. It's not my work. It's not my work to decide who is or isn't or how much it's happened or not happened. I have to kind of file this into that place of as the heavens are above the earth, so God's ways are higher than my ways. I don't think we can fit God into this perfect box and say, well, my brain can't comprehend just exactly how this works, so let's, let's define it for God. If he, you know, he's left it open in both places, that there are places that the Bible clearly speaks to choice, and there's all other places that the Bible clearly speaks to election, right? So God's ways are higher than mine. And, and any time we come to a topic like this, we have to uh, accept a degree of mystery within the scriptures and within who God is, because we cannot completely comprehend him. Right? We're the created beings. He's the creator. And if we could totally and fully understand everything about God, well, I think he'd cease to be God at that point. Right? <laughs> if, if, if I'm going to worship something that I can completely understand, then, he, then we would be on the same level. And we're not on the same level. Right? So God's ways are higher than my ways. God does things different than I do them. So, and, and here's another reason, too, that, that this is not the only text that speaks to um, a, a, a non-believer's condition, spiritual condition. There are other places in the scriptures that speak to that same uh, position that don't use the word dead, right? So, so we can't use, and, and <laughs> that's not to say, so throw, throw, throw this one out. We're not dead in our, of course we're dead in our trespasses. That's what it says. Okay, um, but there's other parts. So if you want to take notes, you can. You don't have to, but if you'd like to. Um, the Bible uses different pictures to describe the state of an unsaved man. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, he says that he's blind. 
So he doesn't use the word dead. He just uses the word blind. In Romans chapter 6, he says that we're slaves to sin or we're slaves to sin. In John chapter 3, he says that the non-believer is a lover of darkness. In, in Mark chapter 2, it says that, that, that the non-believer or those who Jesus came to save are sick. So there are these different words that we see. In Luke 15, it says they're lost. In Ephesians chapter 2, it says alien, stranger, and foreigner. In Ephesians chapter 2, as we're going to look at in just a second, uh, verse 3, it says a child of wrath. And in Colossians chapter 1, it says under the power of darkness. So, uh, so in some ways, the, uh, un, or the, yeah, the unregenerate uh, man is dead, and in other ways, he's not. Uh, so it's valid, I would say, to, uh, and others would say, to appeal to all men to believe right? To, to preach the gospel to all and not to like first look for evidence that someone is being regenerated, right? God does that work no matter what of regenerating a person. God does the work no matter what of, of sanctifying a person. And, and we see through scripture, sanctification comes after salvation, okay? So, um, at this rate, we'll never finish. Um, even, that was the first, what, uh, five verses, uh, five words uh, of the uh, thing uh, that he made us alive <laughs> and we were dead. But that's okay. We're going we're to move on uh, from there. But he says we were dead in trespasses uh, and in sins. What does that mean? Uh, the idea behind the word trespasses is that we've crossed a line. You, you, everyone puts up the signs or has seen the signs at least, hopefully not gone through the signs, but the signs say what? Do not trespass. What does that mean? Don't cross this line. Stay on that side and, and the stuff on this side stays on this side. You stay on that side. To trespass would be to what? To cross that line. Okay. So he said we were dead in trespasses, which means that we are people who had, um, sadly probably still have sometimes here and there, uh, cross and challenge God's boundaries. And the word sin is a term that means to miss the mark, right? It's, it's an archery term, right? You'd aim for that target. You're trying to hit that bullseye. When you miss the bullseye, whether you miss by this much or whether you miss by the, you know, the span of the room, you've missed, right? It's not perfect. You're aiming for, and, and in, in our lives, right, we aim for perfection, but when we miss perfection, we're what? We're sinners, We've missed the mark of perfection. And so I like the way John Stott says this. Uh, he says, before God, we were both rebels and failures, trespassing, speaking to man being a rebel, and sin speaking to man being a failure. So we were both rebels and failures before. Th this, and we'll talk about it a, a little bit more, but we're bad. Like, humans are bad. We're sinful. And there's no way around it. There's no way to say, well, I think humans are generally, and there is an argument, right? People, oh, well, I think people are generally good. It's just, you know, if they have a bad atmosphere, then, well, I think that makes them worse, no doubt. But it doesn't make them bad. They're born bad. And, and, and I think to even look back, to say, because then we would be disagreeing with God, saying, I wasn't that bad, or it wasn't that bad. No, it is that bad. He says we were dead to trespass and sins, and he's made us alive right? Now, just how bad was it? Verses two and three talk about that. He says, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience, among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. And we were by nature children of wrath, just like the others. He says, in which you once walked, at one time we lived in these trespasses and sins, according to the course of the world or the ways of the world, which were orchestrated by Satan. Satan, who we would call the prince of the power of the air, is still very much active among those in rebellion to God, or as he says, the sons of disobedience. Now, one of the things that he does say is, uh, again, you once walked the sin nature that we had inherited from Adam. Again, I, I, I don't believe, uh, and I don't think many should believe, that, that we're born good and we turn bad. And if you don't believe that, just have a child or be around a child. You don't have to teach them to be sinners, right? It's just natural. It's their natural thing. They're not considerate, right? They don't share. They hit just naturally. You don't have to say, hey, and this is how you hit someone. Now, you could teach them how to hit someone better, Right? <laughs> You could teach them that part. You could teach them how to, and, and again, no, it's a natural thing. Um, and it's not just the, no one te taught me to sin. No, one te We can learn to sin better though, right? 
right? We can learn to be more sly about the way we, or try to, you know, cover our tracks, you know, uh, when, when we sin. We can learn that stuff. But, but because we're children of Adam and daughters of Eve, man, we are sinners. And there's no, and there's no way, um, I think, to convince me otherwise, I don't think there's any way to convince anyone otherwise, that we're, that we're born with this sin nature. Now, he also says, uh, in which you once walked, he says that in verse 2, uh, meaning that no longer should we walk that way. There has been a change, hasn't there? Uh, that, that once we've been made alive in Jesus, there should be a difference. And the illustration about being dead in our sins, a dead man would feel perfectly comfortable in a coffin. But if he were to be made alive again, he'd instantly feel suffocated and uncomfortable, wouldn't he? And, and so there would be a strong urge to escape from the coffin and to leave it behind. In the same way, uh, when we were spiritually dead, we felt comfortable in trespass and sin. But having come uh, to new life, we feel we have to escape that coffin and leave it behind. Now, what were the things that we were doing? He says, um, in which you once walked according to the course of the world, right? Uh, according to the prince of the power of the air, and who now works in the, in the sons of disobedience and sin. Uh, we were responding to our own nature and even the dictates of the world and of the one who's in charge of the world right now, Satan. To, to his guidance. The prince of the power of the air is a, uh, a title um, that Satan gets as, as uh, the authority of this realm. If you remember when uh, Jesus was being tempted in the wilderness and Satan goes, all these kingdoms of the world, I'll give them to you. Well, that seems kind of weird. Well, wouldn't you kind of go, who's he to give it to Jesus? Doesn't Jesus own it? Not right now. Like, like Satan's leasing right now right? He's leasing the place. He, at this point in time, until Jesus comes back to establish his rule and reign, um, Satan's the one who's pulling the strings right now, right? If we ever wonder, why is the world so bad? And some people are tempted sometimes, why would God send such a catastrophe? Why would God make this happen? Now, God allows everything, right? But God's not the one making it happen. And, and there's that old saying, right? And that if you got a problem with the world, take it up with the current management, He's the one, Satan's the one that's making the place a mess, right? And, 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 and the prince of the power of the air is kind of that, that word that we use. What were the things that we were doing? So we see, you know, our sin nature, that we were walking, you know, bad before, before God and, and, and trespassing against him, okay? And then we see that, that Satan, you know, he's the author kind of of that or, or, or at least the, the one who's, who's swaying things. Um, and what were the things we were doing? He says, we embraced the lusts of the flesh among whom you... you all once conducted ourselves in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. What does that mean? And when we think of lust, we always, you know, move straight to sensual things, but that's not necessarily all this is talking about. Sure, it talks about that, right? Any type of sexual impropriety, yeah, sure, that all fits under there. But that idea of the lust of the flesh is whatever we wanted, we gave ourselves, right? There, there was no, there was no uh, uh, abstaining from anything. It was like, hey, if that's what my appetites are, that's what I'm going to do. If we wanted it, we gave it to ourselves. We didn't so, say no, no matter what it was. Uh, we, we didn't care if it was in opposition to God, did we? Most of us did it, right? As you are, I mean, unless you already had some kind of like Christian background or somebody who was telling you these things, you would go, I don't care. Like, I'm going to give myself what I want. Most most people again they're so they're blind to the things uh, of the of of God and so they just live by nature and he says and we were by nature children of wrath that when you give yourself everything you want you will slowly become a child of wrath and why is that because that that wrath that kind of anger that comes out will soon start intersecting with other people who are giving themselves whatever they want right. If I just said, hey, I get to do whatever I want, but you also get to do whatever you want, there, there, would, be, there would be some conflict, wouldn't there? Like at first, we'd probably manage to miss each other, but if, if I get every single one of my desires, at some point, that's going to intersect with some of your desires. And then what happens after that? How do we settle it? If I, don't, if I never have to be told I'm wrong, you never have to be told you're wrong, at some point, like, it's going to come to this, right? If you don't believe me, go watch the news or be on social media for any more than 10 seconds. Yeah? I mean, I, I, I've 
<laughs> I probably shouldn't, but I do. I love to read comments, right? I love to read the comments on social media that people, you, and it can be this easy thing, right? You know, it's, I'm a baseball fan, right? You could watch like a baseball post and it's like, and it's Ken Griffey Jr. giving hitting advice. And in the comments, people will be fighting each other on why that's wrong. And you're like, how do you argue with Ken Griffey? He's one of the best hitters ever, you know? And, it, and, and, and everybody, but why? Because everyone wants to be right. Every, they're children of wrath. Okay, and people wrath out, man. They get because they're just like, I am gonna. I, it's my way or the high, and this is the problem. When we have a culture who who decides it doesn't want to have an authority and come under the authority of Jesus Christ, is what happens. It starts going whichever way it wants. You can't tell me no. And it, again, they teach it at a young age, right? That it's like, hey, you just do what's right for you. That doesn't work. That doesn't work. Do what's right for you because I don't agree with a lot of other people. Right? So, so what, what, all, what needs to happen is we need to become governed by God. And so we were by nature children of wrath, he says, just as the others. The, the, and here's an interesting thing as well. Children of wrath seems to be the title we're given. Some people would say, oh, well, we're all children of God. I don't ascribe to that. I don't think the scriptures ascribe, uh, ascribe to that. What, what do the scriptures say that we all have a common creator? God created all of us, right? We're all made in the image of God. Everyone has a chance to, or everyone bears the image of God, but they're not his children. You got to be adopted into the family, right? Those are the children of God. If anything, we're given the title children of wrath. And Jesus, if you remember, he, uh, he at least left the Pharisees out of that family of children of God. He called them a brood of vipers, if you remember. And he said, and your father is who? The devil. So, so Jesus didn't say, oh, we're all children of God. No, you got to be adopted into that family. And so, so then uh, we have to get to being reconciled or being bought back again. If we follow the, the, the plan from very beginning to, to how it goes, you know, Adam and Eve, you know, made there by God in the garden, they were his children, but then that sin that they committed then separated them from God, right? And so then the whole process began, that whole timeline that goes of reconciliation, of redeeming or buying back what was rightfully God's, but it had been given over to, 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 to the enemy, yeah? And now it's in the process of being bought back. So, so what we had all through the Old Testament, and we'll just give a quick brief history, is that because of sin, men needed something to like be made right with God again. So you, you go through Exodus, you get to chapter 20, you'll get the law. You get through all, you get into Leviticus, you'll go how that law is going to actually be, be working and how the sacrifice is going to happen. But ever since the beginning, when Adam and Eve sinned, if you remember, they covered themselves in leaves. You remember that, yeah? They covered themselves in leaves. What did God do? God provided for them a covering. How did he provide a covering? He killed an animal. An innocent animal died to give them their covering. And we see from there and then all the way through that something innocent always has to die for the one that's guilty. So they used animal sacrifice. You can go through Leviticus. You could, you could read it real clearly about the different offerings, the different sacrifices, how something innocent. And you'd see that even the people, they'd put their hand on the head of that animal, right, to identify, kind of transfer their sin onto it. And then, you know, the blood flows out, that blood. And then in Leviticus, very clearly, right, he says it's the blood that makes atonement for the soul. It, it's it's uh, the life is in the blood. You see both those things established in Leviticus, okay? So that was God's way, that you would have all these, all these animals come. And then Hebrews tells us that there came a point that the blood of bulls and the blood of goats was not enough. It was not enough to, to cleanse people from their sins. Year by year, this would happen, right? And people would go, they'd have little offerings here, and then you have that day of atonement, that big day in the Jewish calendar when, when they would like do sacrifice for, for kind of all the people so they could be okay with God for just another year. Our sins, our, well, theirs back then, was just covered, temporarily covered. But you needed a greater sacrifice. Who's that greater sacrifice? It's Jesus. That Jesus, who is the Son of God, God in the flesh, 100% man, 100% God, right? That only he could pay the total punishment and, the to and take on the total wrath of God that sin deserved, but still be able to redeem people. Does that make sense? And so, and so that's what we have, the blood of bulls, the blood of goats, not enough to cover sin. So then Jesus comes and not just covers our sin temporarily. He wipes it away. The slate's clean. We've been forgiven. 
Okay, so that's what we're looking at here. And, and, so, and so how did that kind of, kind of go? Or why did God do it that way? And, and, and so verses four uh, and, and five, just four for now. He says, but God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us. That little phrase in verse four, that but God, is the best about face, the best slamming on the brakes and turning in the other direction, right? Because he was going down. He said, you were dead in trespasses and sins. You once walked according to the course of the world, the spirit who, who works in the sons of disobedience, conducting yourselves in the lust of your flesh, and you were a child of wrath, just like the others. He goes, but God, but God, that he, he goes, er, turn around, boom. We go this way now. God who is rich in mercy, and because of the great love with which he loved us. The reasons for this salvation is that God is rich in mercy and he has a great love that he focuses on us. And we'll get to that it's like that's not our doing, that's his doing. Our doing is those first three verses, right? The nonsense, the garbage, the bad, what do they say, just bad to the bone we were. But God who's rich in mercy. Now, to understand God's mercy, we have to understand his justice first. And what is justice? Justice is to, is to evenly receive like the punishment for what you've done, right? That's justice. So, so we, we, we like justice a lot of times when it doesn't have to do with us. Um, you know, like you, you watch something on the news and you see somebody do a really bad thing and you're like, I wish, oh, like they just need justice. I hope justice is served, you know? Like, we just want it to be served to them, you know, just meet it out, just perfect. They should get everything that they deserve because they're terrible people, you know, whatever. Uh, and then usually when it comes from us, we're like, a uh, little mercy, please. Uh, mercy is not getting what we deserve. Justice would be get, getting exactly what we deserve, right? So, so God owes that to us, doesn't he? To just give us exactly what we deserve. And you see it spelled out in the Old Testament, in, in Exodus, and into, you know, through Deuteronomy, where it's like they, they had that thing, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, a blow for a blow, you know, like that's just the way that it goes. That would be perfect justice meted out. Mercy is to not get what we deserve. That, that pun that's why, you know, the guy whose head is on the cho chopping block cries out for what? Mercy. Don't give me what I deserve. Don't give, I know I deserve it. Please don't give it to me right? That's mercy, is to not get what we deserve. And God is, uh, doesn't just have a little bit of mercy, right? He says that he is what? Rich in mercy. He's got plenty of this forgiveness. He has a lot of it. We're going to get into more as we start getting into the grace of God in just a few uh, chapters and minutes here. And this great love with which he loved us. Some warp the idea of God's great mercy and love into something that justifies our pride. Some imagine that God loves us because we're so lovable. That's not the case. That's not the case. Most of us are not very lovable and certainly not lovable to God, okay? It's because of his great love. God's love is so great that it extends even to the unlovely, the children of wrath that we said we were. So uh, every reason for God's mercy, it's found in him. We give him no reason to love us, yet in the greatness of his love, he loves us in a great love, with a great love anyway. So uh, we need to stop trying to make ourselves lovable to God and simply receive his great love. Right? And we'll get into that, that it's not a work of our own flesh. We will always be unworthy of that love. He also did this, he said, when we were dead. He said, when we were dead in our trespass, even when we were dead, even when we were enemies of God, he showed his love towards us. Right? The Bible says, even while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He didn't wait for us to start becoming lovable. He, he loved us when we had nothing that would make him want to love us. And this is very important because this would seem to be the first requirement to being saved is that you got to be dead and dead of every attempt to justify ourselves before God. We don't bring anything to the table. We don't bring anything to the table. We, and, and again, we can, we can try to believe that we do. You know, well, well you know, I, at least I have these talents and abilities. God doesn't need those talents and abilities. 
Well, well you know, I'm, I'm pretty nice to, you know, whatever. That's not enough for salvation. And again, to, we, we have to differentiate here what we're talking about today. Today, in chapters 2, 1 through 9, we are talking about salvation. Salvation is, is, is being saved. It happens in a moment, right? It's that point where we come to where God, like, wipes away our sin. This can sometimes be confused with what comes after salvation. Salvation is just the beginning of the, what we call a walk with Christ, well, the walking is the part that takes the long time, isn't it? That's that whole process of sanctification, right? But salvation, in a moment, it happens, and then sanctification, that whole process from the time we get saved until the time we die, that we are being conformed into the image of Christ, growing in Him. And, and, and we need to make that differentiation because some people would say, they would look at this text and go, well, God just has all the grace in the world. I can keep doing whatever I want. I can keep saying, God loves me so much and, and, and he loves us enough right into the family, but he loves us enough to say, don't stay that way. We're not supposed to stay this way. We're supposed to grow. And then he, and he'll even say, walk worthy of the calling. He says in verse 10 of this same chapter that there's good works that God has preordained that we would walk in them. So there is a walk that goes with it. And jumped ahead a couple of verses there, but that's okay, we'll be fine. So he made us alive together with Christ. This is what God did to those who were dead in sin. He shared in our death so that we can share in his resurrection life. The old man is crucified and we become a new creation in Christ. And the Bible tells us that the old things pass away and all things become new. And then he says this. He, he says... Um, that we've been raised up, verse 7. He says, we've been raised up together and made us to sit in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. He's raised us up. This is the present position of the Christian. We have a new place of, uh, for living, a new arena of existence. Our nature is, is changed. Before, sin used to be our destination, right? B before, we didn't care about anything else. We, we were without hope, without God in the world. Our destination was sin all the time. Now, our nature has changed, that now we have a nature that desi desires to please God. Does that mean we get it every time? No, it doesn't mean we get it every time. We still live in these bodies that will fail, but again, we're, we're told in uh, Galatians that if we're filled with the Spirit, he says, walk in the Spirit and you might not sin today. It doesn't say that. What does it say? It says, it says, walk in the Spirit and you shall not, right? You shall not uh, fulfill the lust of the flesh. He says that, right? Sorry, I turned the wrong way. Uh. I say then, walk in the Spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So we have been given this new nature. Now, whether we always walk in that nature, you know, again, we, we go back and forth. We're sons of Adam, right? We're daughters of Eve. We will continue to struggle with those things. But we have been given a thing where sin is no longer our destination. It's just our distraction, isn't it? That sin comes and, it, and it's always trying to grab at us and, and, and get us to go back and fulfill its lust. But we have a desire that goes, no, I don't want to do that. And when we do get tripped up in sin, what's our desire to do? To repent and get back in line with God. So, he says, we've been called now to sit in these heavenly places. This guy Clark says it this way. He says, and now we sit in heavenly places. We have a right to the kingdom of God, anticipate his glory, and we're indescribably happy in the possession of this salvation and in our fellowship with Christ Jesus. We have fellowship with him. We sit together with him in these heavenly places. I don't know exactly how that works. I don't know exactly how that works right now. Like, are we there? Like, right now? Like, I don't get it. But like our mind, and, and it's this reminder, right? Our citizenship belongs where? In heaven. It's not here. Earth is not our home. And he says that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in the future. And again, I don't understand how this happens either, but it does. That, that God will continue to show the exceeding riches of his grace to us. God, never will, God will never stop dealing with us on the basis of his grace and will forever continue to unfold uh, its riches throughout eternity and will only come to understand them more. But it's his grace that we're understanding. And again, uh, Spurgeon says of the exceeding riches of his grace, it's kind of long, so sorry, bear with me on this long quote. Uh, 
So it is with the grace of God. He has as much grace as you want, and he has a great deal more than that. The Lord has as much grace as the whole universe will require, but he has vastly more. He overflows. All the demands that can, be, can ever be made on his grace, on the grace of God, will never impoverish him or even diminish his store of mercy. There will remain an incalculably precious mine of mercy as full as when he first began to bless the sons of men. You know, there's that old kind of story about the, the little bird who shows up to the lake to drink water. You know, it's been flying and it's tired and it needs water. And it takes, you know, oh, it's a little bird, you know, and it starts, you know, drinking. It goes, I better stop. I don't want to drink the whole thing. And sometimes I think that's how we can get with the grace of God. Going, God, I'm afraid maybe you're, you've run out of enough grace for me. Right? The Bible tells us where sin abounds, grace abounds much more. I think as we've walked with the Lord for a long time, again, sometimes we can even just throw a guilt trip on our own selves and say, man, I've used my allotment now. I'm tapped out. I've done too many things wrong. And so what do we start doing? We start trying to make ourselves holy. We try to, to forgive or to, to you know, get to a point of earning back God's forgiveness. Never. You can't. You can't, and, and you go, I know, but God, like, like I've, I've failed in this same way this many times. I'm sure you're done with me. And it would be as the same as that bird saying, I've, I've drank all the water. You can't ever. God has so much more forgiveness than we have sin. And so in Romans, Paul answers the question that you might have in your mind right now. So then can we just keep sinning? He says, where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. He says, so should we, should we continue sinning that grace may abound? He goes, God forbid, that would be stupid. He doesn't say stupid. I said that part. But it would be stupid to do that, to say, well, if God's going to keep forgiving, then I'll just keep sinning. Well, here's the other part. Us continuing to sin is bad for us as well, okay? Not only, not only is, it, is it not pleasing to God, it's bad for us. You follow sin, and, and the Bible tells us later, is it in James or 1 John, where it's like, you know, uh, that, that sin, when it's full grown, brings forth death. No good. It's no good. So, so we don't keep sinning just because the grace is there. But like that wonderful hymn that we sing, right? Amazing grace. That it should be this way, that it's his grace that teaches us to what? To fear him. It was grace that taught my heart to fear. And grace my fears relieved. Right? That it's God's grace. So what exactly is this grace that we talk about? Well, to, to understand grace, we have to understand mercy and justice. Right? If, if justice is getting what you deserve, and, and then mercy is not getting what you deserve, grace is getting what you don't deserve, going above and beyond. Right? It goes above. It's this unmerited favor. It's this free gift from God. So, so we'll give a little example it, uh, to, to, to be given justice. So say, say you walk by me and uh, maybe you've been having a bad day, bad week, whatever. You, you just haven't been, you know, you're out of sorts or whatever. And you're, and you're kind of angry with me for whatever reason. I couldn't imagine a reason why. <laughs> just kidding. Um, that was a joke. I could see plenty of reasons why. Uh, I think uh, we'd be more surprised that there's not reasons why. But anyways, so you walk by, you step on my foot, right? On purpose, and, and you step on my foot um, with your heel, too, you know, and you're just like, oh, really get the real weight on there. And, um, and then, uh, and so justice would be for what? For me to step on your foot back in the same place and in the same way with the same amount of pressure that you gave to me and to inflict the same amount of pain on you that I had, right? That would be eye for an eye or foot for foot in this case, okay? So that would be justice is to get back evenly what was given. Mercy would be to do what? To just forgive and say, I forgive you, that's okay. Hey, whatever the reason, you've had a bad day, I'll just, I'll take the pain, okay? And, and, and I'm not going to go further. That would be to not give you back what you deserve. That's mercy. But then grace goes above and beyond that, right? To Now I'm gonna give you what you don't deserve. Because you certainly didn't even deserve for me to not give that back to you, Right? It was mercy for that, but now I'm going to give you beyond that and say, hey, let's go have an ice cream. Let's go figure out, like, what's going on, and let me just show you, like, love instead, right? Not returning evil for evil, right, or reviling for reviling. Let me show you love instead, and, uh, and you go, well, that would be really silly. Well, how much sillier is it that God has 
allowed for us to have a way to heaven. You don't deserve it. I don't deserve it. I remember telling my dad one day when I was little, and then this became a pretty normal thing in our house. I go, I don't deserve this. He goes, do you want to know what you do deserve? You deserve death and you deserve hell. That's what you deserve in this life. That's what you deserve. That's what every person deserves in this life. Death and hell and separation from God. Why? Because we're bad. Because we're sinners. Because we can't hit the mark of perfection even when we want to hit the mark of perfection. We still miss it. And that's the grace of God, isn't it? That God would say, not only do I not give you all the punishment, so God's soft on sin? No way he's not soft on sin. If you think God's soft on sin, you just look at the cross. In no way did God go easy on sin. In no way did God go, ah, it's not a big deal. It is a big deal. That's why he put his son on the cross. And that's what paid for the sin. But we couldn't pay for our own sin, so he paid for our sin. So God's not soft on sin. Don't think that, okay? It's his grace and it's his mercy. And so he has forgiven us. He's begotten us again to a living hope. And again, man, you think of all the grace that God bestows on us, not just giving us eternity and, and be forever with Jesus in heaven, but even before that, doesn't he pour out his grace on us? That, that he give, he's given us an abundant life. He's given us joy and peace and all these things that we have. He's given us his Holy Spirit and power to walk through and live this Christian life the way we should live it. Man, he's been gracious. And so he reminds us now, verses 8, 9, and 10, uh, he, he says, For by grace you've been saved through faith, and it's not of yourselves. It's a gift of God. It's not of works, lest anyone should boast, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared before him that we should walk in them. He says, it's by grace that you've been saved. Now, it's, he says, it's through faith, right? Not of yourself. It's the gift of God. So it's grace and it's through faith. So uh, I like this example that we can think of it as water flowing through a hose. The water is the important part, but it's communicated through the hose. The hose does not quench your thirst. The water does, but the hose brings water to the place so you can benefit from it, right? So it's God's grace that saves us. And it's through faith. Now, well, and, and, and it's a gift of God. The, the work of salvation is the gift of God. Guys much smarter in Greek than I uh, look at this text, the way they've translated and, and talked about it. Uh, they say uh, that the grammar here indicates that the, word, uh, the words apply to the gift of salvation and not directly to the faith that's mentioned. And Clark, this commentator, emphatically states that the original Greek is clear in noting uh, when it says that it is a gift of God, it refers to salvation and not faith being the gift. Faith is a gift, but it's not this gift specifically that he's talking about. The, gr uh, the gr uh, great Greek scholar Dean Alford also clearly pointed out that this is, that the not of yourselves refers to salvation in this passage. And, and we know that even the faith we have from God is a gift, but the, but the act Act of faith, just like we talked about at the beginning, this free moral agency of man, at least a little bit of it, right? The faith, the, the act of faith is man's own. God will never believe for any man no more than he would repent for a man. So, so in some way or another, we respond to this. His grace, though, is what is, is the gift. That's what's been paid for. And it's not of works. It's not of works, he says, lest anyone should boast. Because what do we have the, the habit of doing? What's our propensity to do? To take credit for things, right? And I think there's times that we can look back and you're like, man, like, man, I'm so glad I came to Christ. Well, I mean, yeah, sure, but wasn't it more him that drew us to him, right? And, and then we could even like start to think we were somehow redeemable that I did good works, I did good things. I, I, I'm the one that did this. And, and the Bible's clear, right? That our own righteousness, the best we can do on our best day, it says our righteousness is like filthy rags before the Lord. If you really get into what that means, it's pretty disgusting. I don't mean to say, that, you know what, that was rude to say it that way. It's not disgusting, but it's, it's not, it is filthy rags, right? That what he, he's speaking of like, like menstrual cloths is what he's talking about, right? That that's the offering we're offering to Lord. Hey, Lord, I have these. This is all my righteousness. It's like, it's nothing. That, it's filthy rags before the Lord. Nobody, nobody's looking for that as payment for anything, right? 
And so he says our righteousness as filthy rags before him. We, we can never think that it was, it was us doing anything as good as we were trying to be that earned our salvation. It's a gift from God. And so in the same way, we had better not put trips on people when we're trying to evangelize or tell people about Jesus. Hey, you got to fix this first. Hey, you better fix that. Hey, you don't be doing that. Before, you, you clean that up before you walk into church. God does that part. God changes someone from the inside out. We don't change them from the outside in. Hey, start looking more like a Christian so you can come to church. No way, we can't do that. That's God's work. Now that's to come hear the word. There's plenty of other stuff as we talk about the sanctification process. Who should be, you know, serving him and representing him? Okay, well, we got to make sure something's happened before that. But I'll say this, I, I always say this. People can come hear the word of God for free. They have to be able to, Right? I won't get into some other, you know, quotes that like, oh, you can just come be however you are. We're not going to cheapen grace and say, hey, you, you come in that way, you stay that way. Heck no. We don't do it that way, right? God, once we come to Christ, he cleans us up. And that's what he says in the next verse. He says, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in. And that word workmanship translated uh, from the Greek, it's a Greek word, poema. Um, it, it, you know, it can be translated poem. The, the Jerusalem Bible translate uh, the, the word workmanship as work of art. That we're God's work of art. God's love is a transforming love. It meets us right where we're at. But, but when we receive this love, it always takes us where we should be going. And, and, and the love of God that saves my soul should also change my life. And that's where some people uh, in the past have kind of, kind of disagreed with certain parts of the scriptures saying that, that Paul the apostle and then James the brother of, of, of Jesus, when James writes his book, it's very much like, works based right it's always like like uh, you know uh, faith without works is uh, faith without works is dead and 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 you know you say you have faith uh, but you don't have works I'll show you my faith by my works is what James says all their and people go they disagreed there's no doubt that Paul and James disagreed I don't believe that for a second uh, well I mean just regular interpersonal disagreements I'm sure happen but 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 as far as them not agreeing on these like theological points here uh, what Paul is talking about so often when he talks about this is that point of bringing us up to salvation. And so much of what James talks about is what happens from salvation on, right? That it's not, uh, it's not that we're saved by our works, but, or, 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 or it's like, it's a faith that works once we're saved. Once we're saved now, now we're compelled. Why? Because how could you not respond to it that way? How, how can we receive such a great gift and go, I'm not going to change that. I'm just going to keep doing the same thing. I'm, I'm going to be just as much a child of wrath as I ever was. Spurgeon says, our new life is, is uh, as truly created out of nothing as were the first heavens and the first earth. This ought to be particularly noticed for there are some who think that the grace of God improves the old nature into a new. It does nothing of the sort. It doesn't improve who we were. We are new creations in Christ. And so today, I don't know where you are in this. Uh, it could be that you're like, I've never really uh, accepted any of this stuff. I've never really ascribed to this stuff. You know, I, I think I'm kind of in line, like uh, Pastor Zeke told little Daniel, right? <laughs> that what we deserve is death and hell. And I, you know, and I'm on a train that way. Well, the good news is you don't have to stay on that train that way, right? That, that God has offered plenty of forgiveness. He's got plenty of grace. No, you don't understand how bad I've been. I don't have to understand how bad you've been. God understands that part. And he's rich in mercy. He, he's rich in forgiveness, and I think we need to get, get uh, remind ourselves on a day like today. See, see, today, you know, a study like this doesn't have a whole lot of practical application of like, go out and now do this thing. It's not really like that today, right? It's, it's go out and enjoy this thing. Enjoy the salvation that God has given us. Like rest in that. I think some of us, we, can, we, we begin to start chasing our tails at some point in the Christian walk. Like, I have to do good things. I have to do the right thing. Oh man, I'm failing so much. Okay, maybe you are failing so much. A righteous man fails seven times, gets right back up. You just gotta get back up. It's time to go. Well, but then I feel like I'm, I'm cheapening God's grace. You, you can't really cheapen it. Like God gave his grace and he gives it in abundance. He has it for you. 
So we don't put guilt trips on ourselves. Now, there is a godly sorrow, the Bible tells us, that leads to repentance. Good. If it's a godly sorrow, good. But if it's something that is separating us from God, then that's of the enemy. Receive the grace of God today. The same grace we needed to save us is the same grace we need to get us through every single day. Right? It's the same grace that works all the way through uh, our, the, the sanctification process into the day that we go and, and we really officially become dead totally. That's the, the final, the time we'll finally be totally freed from sin is, is when we don't have to sin anymore because we're dead and we're in the presence of God. But enjoy that today. Rest in that today. And, and then, you know, again, so, so wherever we find ourselves in that, and again, if, if you don't know Christ in a personal way today, we'd invite you to come know him today to receive that gift of salvation. He offers it, and so receive it. So let's pray. Father, we just thank you so much for who you are. And Lord, uh, maybe there are, uh, maybe there might be somebody here today who has never received that free gift of salvation, never really understood what it meant when Jesus died on the cross. And now that we walked through all the way through animal sacrifice, through, through Jesus dying for us because we're bad to the bone, you know, uh, Lord, we just thank you that you have offered such a great salvation. And so if there's anybody here today, Lord, we pray that you draw them to yourself and, and that they wouldn't think that they got to clean themselves up first, but Lord, that they could just receive the free gift that you gave. And then Lord, for all of us in here, continue to help us that since we've been forgiven, Lord, help us to live for you now. Help us to walk with you. Help us to do the things that please you. Give us the power uh, that you give when you fill us with your Holy Spirit to walk the Christian life the way we should walk, to abstain from what we ought to abstain to, not living for the lust of the flesh. And so if that's anybody in here right now, just with our heads bowed, um, if, if anybody says, yeah, you know what, I need that free gift of salvation, I, I don't have it, uh, you know, I know I'm a sinner, I know I deserve, you know, God's wrath, uh, but I want to accept his forgiveness. If that's anybody here today, I just ask you to slip your hand in the air, I'll pray for you. Um, but if that's anybody at all, um, Hey, praise God. That's awesome. I saw those hands. Great. That's awesome. Now we're going to say, we'll say a simple prayer. It's not the prayer itself that saves you. It's, it's God who saves you. But just, you know, in your heart, you could just say this prayer. You just say, dear God, I know I'm a sinner. And I believe that Jesus came to save me. And I believe that, that his payment was plenty to pay for my sin. And I believe he died on the cross. I believe he rose again for my hope and for my justification. And so as best as I know how, by faith, I'm committing my life to you. Please fill me with your Holy Spirit and help me to walk in the way you want me to walk. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. For those who raised your hand, please, we'll have uh, some folks up here for, for, here for prayer. Uh, I'll be in the back if you want to just kind of let us know or we'll pray with you kind of one-on-one. But, but praise the Lord for that. Um, that, that